Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, election analysis with Dr. Larry Jacobs of the University of Minnesota. Cynthia Bowerly, the longest serving revenue commissioner in state history, says farewell. And the Secretary of State offers important information for voters. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. It's hard to imagine any more October surprises, and yet the month is still young, and voters have learned that just about anything can and may happen. This week, I spoke with distinguished University of Minnesota political science professor, Dr. Larry Jacobs, and I began by asking him how many voters are, as yet, undecided, and if last-minute surprises impact voters' decisions. According to polls, there are about 5-7% who say they're undecided. I think there's probably another three or four percent who are attached to each candidate who might um, melt away, consider another candidate. But it's a really small number, you know, possibly 10, 12 percent. This is a tight election in which the overwhelming majority of voters are saying they're locked in on their candidate and they know who they're going to vote for. When you observe the 2020 election process, does the dramatic increase in absentee or early voting cause you to pause when assessing the possible outcomes or considerations? For example, many voters have already cast their ballots before President Trump was diagnosed with COVID-19. Does his illness impact anyone who hasn't voted? How, what does this early voting process have to do with any of these late breaking news things? First off, I am quite confident that here in Minnesota and in most other states, our election officials are hardworking, they are nonpartisan, and they're going to do a great job. You know, it is arbitrary when election day actually lands. There's always more events that come after it. I think early voting, whether we like it or not, it is here to stay. It has been growing over the last decade. Uh, Minnesota has actually now embraced uh, no excuse, absentee balloting. Um, so I think it's here. I think it's going to obviously be much larger in 2020 because of COVID than we've seen before. We're going to have to get used to it, particularly in states that don't allow election officials to even open the mailed-in ballots and begin to organize themselves to do a count. Well, we should note that Minnesota is not one of those states. The machines will be loaded and ready to run on Election Day. But speaking of that, President Trump in the first uh, presidential debate said that he may not accept the results of the election, pointing to abstantiated claims of ballot fraud. Um, also during that debate, he would not de denounce white supremacist groups. Do either of those factors play into how people will vote at the state level? You know, I think it's been a big mistake by the president to be talking down mail-in ballots. There are a lot of my friends who are Republican strategists who worry that they may now lose the advantage that Republicans have often had with mail-in or absentee ballots. Uh, second, we have laws in this country. They are enforced at the state level where elections are mandated by the Constitution to be run. We will have a normal legal constitutional process. We will have an outcome announced. What the president is saying and what will happen, I think, will be quite different. According to current polls, the president may well be far behind, even on election night. So I think there's a lot of nightmare scenarios out there. Some of them are being floated by commentators and media organizations looking for attention. But at this point, I'm not overly alarmed. I think it's gonna be bumpy. There's gonna be charges and counter charges. But I just have so much confidence in our hardworking, nonpartisan um, and conscientious election officials in almost every state that I think we'll get to the proper outcome. Uh, even though Governor Tim Walz is not on the November ballot, the use of his executive powers during the COVID-19 pandemic has been a regular topic of discussion in each special session that we've had at the legislature. 
So he's not on the ballot, but will, do you think that people's feelings about those executive powers will play into whether they decide to vote for Republicans or DFLers in this, in November? One of the most striking patterns that's emerged over the last few decades is that our politics at the state and local level have been nationalized. And so you see very close connection between how the presidential election goes and which party does better in a particular state. Sometimes it's referred to as wave elections just become more common. And when you look at a lot of the media coverage, of course, not this program, it tends to be focused on the national news. Look at the front page of the Star Tribune. It's looking at national elections about Donald Trump. It's about Joe Biden, it's about, you know, how the race is looking in the polls. I mean, all these stories and so little on state and local elections. So yes, the conversation and the debate between uh, the Senate Republicans and Governor Waltz about his emergency powers has been significant. It's an important debate. And frankly, I don't think it's going to have much impact on voters who are primarily dialed in so the national elections will be influenced by that national context. During President Trump's rallies in northern Minnesota, he has touted the endorsement of some DFL mayors. Is the DFL party changing um, and how and is the rural urban split growing even wider? There's no doubt that our politics have changed profoundly. We are seeing the Republican strength in the suburbs melt into greater Minnesota where Republicans are now driving Democrats out of the Iron Range, which used to be their stronghold. And so, yes, you know, we're seeing DFL mayors, these former DFL mayors coming out support of President Trump because if they're gonna stay in office, they have to change parties or at least uh, get on board with uh, the president if they want to stay in office. But if you look in the Twin Cities, you're also seeing the suburbs tilting towards the DFL. It's one of the reasons why you see the DFL doing well in statewide races, because they're able to get those large, large majorities in the urban core. They're able to kind of fluff it up with some of the suburban votes. And it's just not enough votes in greater Minnesota to overcome that. Um, there's a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. It raises concerns about the business model of social media companies and how the algorithms that they use are increasing the divisiveness in this country, potentially leading even to the demise of democracy. Is social media having a detrimental effect on political discourse and could it ultimately impact democracy? You know, we've had predictions about the demise of American democracy since, frankly, its beginning when the Constitution was drawn up in 1787. You look at the first real competitive election between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams in 1796. And um, there was, you know, absolute certainty this was the end of the Republic. Our democracy is stable. It has been around for a long time and most Americans want it to continue. Social media, it's like radio when it came in in the 1930s. TV when it burst in in the 1960s and it expanded. It's a, it's a new tool. It is uh, being used by partisans to kind of silo into information that tends to reinforce their worldview, their biases, um, some of their prejudices. And that's a problem. But we also have organizations uh, that are talking to the country. And I think, you know, some of this is from news programs like this. It's coming from our community organizations that are bringing people together. So I'm not worried about the demise of democracy. It's changing, but it's not a news story. Dr. Larry Jacobs, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.
Cynthia Bowerly is the longest serving Department of Revenue Commissioner in Minnesota's history, serving at the helm of the agency for nearly six years. I spoke with her this week, her last week on the job, and I asked her what she credits for the longevity of her leadership. Well, I first just want to say what an honor and privilege it has been to serve as Revenue Commissioner for the state of Minnesota. And I think the reason that, uh, that I, I stayed so long is because it's just an incredible place to be, an incredible place to work. You know, uh, my colleagues here are talented and dedicated public servants. Uh, my colleagues in the governor's office are uh, dedicated to serving Minnesotans from all across the state of Minnesota and really focusing on those who haven't had the same opportunity. So with a great team around me, it was just really a privilege and an honor and a real pleasure uh, to serve in this role. Now you replaced Myron Franz in 2015. He was the commissioner of revenue. He went over to Minnesota management and budget. The two of you have worked closely together over all of those years. And as you know, he recently left MMB to go to the University of Minnesota. Did his leaving impact your decision to leave in any way? No, it didn't. Uh, I have worked closely with Myron and that has been a real pleasure. Uh, and in the Dayton administration, I also had a chance to work with Jim Showalter. And so uh, really actually loved the opportunity to get to work with Jim again. Um, it's just coincidental that our timing happened to uh, come at the same uh, in the same window, but uh, it had nothing to do with my decision. Um, and I know that uh, Jim will continue to lead MMB in a great way for the state of Minnesota. And I know that my uh, successor will also do a great job for Minnesota. And they will, and our agencies, Department of Revenue and MMB always work closely together, just the nature of the roles. And that, uh, that won't change. And speaking of your successor, your successor is going to come into the job while the state, the nation, and the world are in the midst of a pandemic which is affecting people's health, but also economies everywhere. What challenges do you foresee the new revenue commissioner having to face? Well, I think as we all know, uh, the new revenue commissioner along with the governor and lieutenant governor and the legislature are going to be facing uh, budget shortfalls. And so that's gonna require a really important conversation about how to fill those gaps. And of course, there are a number of budget tools to do that. Um, uh, raising revenue is certainly one of them. And so I think uh, one of the primary roles of the next commissioner will be working with the governor and lieutenant governor to develop plans for how to uh, balance that budget. Um, again, revenue will probably be a part of that conversation uh, as other budget tools are, as, as, and those are of course uh, supported and developed by MMB. But that's a big part of the conversation. But I think also uh, the next commissioner will also have to continue to support the agency and all of our employees who are working hard through this pandemic to continue to serve Minnesotans. That is going to present you know, ongoing opportunities really for changes. Um, we're now using our audit room more than ever. So our auditors are not necessarily going into physical businesses, but they are working with their customers remotely as everyone has moved uh, to remote working uh, wherever possible. And so I think those are, are going to be on, those are opportunities, frankly, for thinking about how we do our work, maybe in a new and a different way with our customers who are also facing new and different ways to do their work. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, for the department to continue to evolve in its service and to continue to ensure that it is reaching out and working with customers who maybe haven't had the access to our tax system in the way that others have in Minnesota. In a press release, Governor Walls called you a servant leader and he said, quote, Commissioner Bowerly sees the big picture, leads with her values and prioritizes the needs of Minnesota children, families and small businesses. You're talking about that a little bit in terms of reaching out to people who, who haven't necessarily had the same access as others before them. Um, and I think that's been part of what's in, been important to you. What, generally speaking, are you most proud of? Well, I think what I am most proud of is the collaborative culture that we have built at the Department of Revenue. And that culture is not only important to our employees, it is. We want to make sure that everyone uh, is, in, is included and can feel like they can bring their whole selves to work. Because when we have that diversity of thought and idea and backgrounds, we make better decisions together. And it's also vitally important because that collaborative 
culture helps us serve our customers better. When we think of our customers, and, and I know uh, folks have challenged me when I talk about taxpayers as customers because uh, they think that it uh, isn't that sort of two-way connection, but it really is. Our tax code is not only about obligation, it's about opportunities. The working family credit, something that we have expanded uh, twice in my time here as commissioner, important uh, important credit to help fight poverty, help bring families, uh, give them more financial stability. Families who are struggling uh, maybe with a couple of jobs but aren't being paid enough to really be stable uh, in their finances. Uh, we have worked hard to, uh, we worked hard to get the provider tax, uh, not only extended but made permanent uh, to ensure that we have health care for some of the most vulnerable in the state of Minnesota. And when I think about the work at the department, we have really focused on reaching out to communities. So we know we've always had a good relationship with the Bar Association and with the Minnesota Society of CPAs. We know how to reach them. We have regular communication with them. We appear at their conferences. There are many Minnesotans who don't have representation when they are thinking about their taxes. And so we've really tried to expand our outreach through VITA, our volunteer income tax sites. We have worked closely with community organizations and we are continuing that work and really focusing on how we can build a more equitable system here in Minnesota, not only in our tax policy, but in our tax administration. And so those are some of the things that I'm really, uh, really proud of having been able to be a part of here at the Department of Revenue. Um, I believe the saying that uh, people will remember how you made them feel more than what you did uh, or said. And so I do hope that uh, as I leave, all of my colleagues here at the Department of Revenue know how much I care about them and about the work that we do for Minnesota. The bulk of your professional life has been in the political arena. Prior to positions in Minnesota state agencies, you were a member of the Federal Election Commission. Before that, you were legislative director for Senator Chuck Schumer of New York. So my qu last question, what's next? Well, what's immediately next is a little bit of time off uh, to consider what is uh, what will be my next adventure. Um, when you are in a role like this one that, uh, that, you, that I have been giving 110% to because that's what this job deserves and that's what the people of Minnesota deserve, uh, it's, you want to take some time and, uh, and, and rejuvenate a little bit and then uh, consider what's next. So that's my, my current plan. So I uh, look forward to a little bit of uh, relaxation. I understand that there are uh, books out there that do not deal with uh, taxes and uh, organizational. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading some of those uh, and just enjoying a little bit of this fall as I consider what's next. Commissioner Bowerly, uh, thank you so much and best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Early voting is underway. Last month, I spoke with Secretary of State Steve Simon about some of the common concerns of voters. Here's a portion of our conversation. I would say that having an election, a statewide election in a time of a pandemic is a big, big challenge. And I think most people who are in this work at the county or city level too, we agree that we have to view this through a public health lens, at least to some extent. And that's what we're doing. Um, and part of it comes down to um, a math problem, really, to be honest. And the math is this. We've got uh, about 3,000 polling places in Minnesota, and we're expecting about 3 million voters in Minnesota. That may be a cautious or conservative number. That math works out quite easily to 1,000 people per polling place. On average, very rough average, some places lower, some places higher, but a working average is 1,000 per polling place. And from a public health standpoint, we want to try to get that number down. That would be a good thing because you're talking about a thousand people and their droplets circulating in close quarters, tight quarters over a 13 hour period, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Those are the poll hours in Minnesota. I vote at a church a few blocks away from where I'm talking to you. It's in the basement of a church. There is not a lot of room down there to expand or grow or go to other places. So we're trying to get that number down balancing with that everyone's right to vote in the polling place of course um, we are urging people to strongly consider voting from home it takes five minutes maximum at a website mnvotes.org and when you go to mnvotes.org you type in your information and it comes right to you so that's the primary focus right in front of us is treating this as a public health event which it is 
you mentioned a lot of things in that question. I'm sure we'll get to right. them in the podcast, but there are yes, a number. Because my next question then, you, you are encouraging absentee ballots. You know, people request their absentee ballot, cast it, then therefore they don't have to go to the polling place. But what impact are these potential problems with the Postal Service going to have on the ability to cast that absentee ballot? Well, so am I concerned and even outraged by the reports about delays at the Postal Service, things were, which were avoidable, things which were conscious decisions which resulted in delays? Of course I am. But does that stop me in any way from urging people to, um, to vote from home this year if that's uh, an option that they're comfortable with? No, it does not stop me. It's full steam ahead. And here's why. We have multiple workarounds to accommodate even delays, starting with a message I'll give now, which is folks should go to mnvotes.org even if they think they might vote from home. I say that because that decision is reversible. You can change your mind. So whatever you do, don't wait until late October. Because if you do that, you're going to slam people right when they shouldn't get slammed. That's when elections administrators in counties and cities at their absolute wit's end, at their absolute busiest. And in other states during the primary process where they saw real chaos, part of it could be traced to that, people waiting to the last minute. So go to mnvotes.org now. Number two, work around of postal delays, is once you know your choices, get your ballot in. It's everyone's right to wait until election day, of course, to get that last morsel of information from the day before, the last ad, the last debate. But if you're a person who knows who you're going to vote for a week out or two weeks out or three weeks out, nothing's going to change your mind, get the ballot in. Third, and this is critical and crucial, this year and this year only, very on brand for 2020, this year and this year only, because of some litigation that resulted in a standing court order, which no one is appealing, all the parties, everyone is agreeing with this, okay? It's no longer the subject of debate. We have a new rule for getting your ballot in. The rule only for this year is it can be postmarked as late as election day, November 3rd, as long as it gets in a week later by November 10th. What that means in terms of your question about the mail is there's an automatic one week buffer period built in. No matter how late you go, even if you're a procrastinator or you do it at the last possible second, you can have no fewer than seven days of a buffer between getting that ballot from point A to point B. That is a huge, huge work around any potential postal delays. Next, I would say, just keep in mind that because you get, just because you get the ballot by mail doesn't mean you have to return it that way. You are free to hand deliver the ballot to the address that's on the envelope, or uh, you can have someone you know and trust deliver it for you. So there are multiple workarounds. And then another one uh, I forgot, which is we have a feature on our website, mnvotes.org, where you can track your ballot. You don't have to just pop it in the and say a little prayer and hope somehow that it gets there. You can know with certainty whether it has. You go to mnvotes.org, you type in your information. I did this myself for the primary, and it will tell you the exact date that it has arrived and it will tell you in black and white that it is being processed or it has been processed. So those are some of the workarounds we have. Yes, is it unfortunate that there are postal delays? Of course it is. Are some of the reports outrageous? Sure. But is that gonna slow down democracy in Minnesota? No, it's not. This is a year during a pandemic when a very safe and effective option, and one that really is in many ways a public service, meaning that everyone who votes from home is making the polling place just a little bit safer for those who choose that option. In this year of all years, it's full steam ahead. People should strongly consider using the mail and voting from home. Now, you mentioned that you can track your ballot once you send it back in. Let's say you've sent it back in, you're tracking it. It's not showing up. It's not showing up. It's not showing up. What do you do then? Yeah, and it happens. You know, it's just bound to happen uh, sometimes. Um, there are uh, two options. Well, I guess three options, depending on when in the calendar or how soon before Election Day. One is just to order another one and have it come to you, and that is done from time to time. If there isn't enough time, if we're talking like three days before the election, four days before the election, then there are still two remaining options. In-person absentee. There are two ways to vote absentee. One is to go to mnvotes.org, order the ballot to come to you at home. The other is to drop by either your city hall or a county office, and if you don't know where that place is, go to that same website, and, and, and it'll tell you. So you can vote in-person absentee on any day up to the day before the election, the Monday before the Tuesday. And then finally, and maybe obviously, even though that might not have been your first choice, you still always have the option of going in and voting on election day. So just because you've ordered an absentee ballot doesn't mean you're locked into that choice. 
I'm glad you said that because that actually was one of my questions. You know, if you order an absentee, but you are like me and you really want to go to the polling place, if right. you can, because it's part of the whole experience, right. you know, do you have that option? And the answer is yes, you do have that option. Absolutely, you do. So you can change your mind or maybe your hand was forced because of the scenario you just laid out. You wanted to vote from home, you mailed it in and you're pushing refresh constantly to see if it's gotten in and it hasn't and you, and you just figure, well, I got to go in and do it myself. One more question, actually two more questions before you go. How is foreign election interference impacting this election? It's not something we've talked about as much as maybe in prior elections, but is it still happening? So um, it's still a crucially and critically important issue. Obviously, COVID-19 has kind of blotted out the sun when it comes to coverage and scrutiny and attention, but this is absolutely still an issue. I and a few members of my staff got a confidential intelligence briefing on exactly this subject at the FBI headquarters. We're going to get at least one more before the uh, general election. We are right now undergoing our latest round of penetration testing that the Department of Homeland Security is doing for exactly this purpose, where they both come into our office and remotely basically test our systems. In essence, try to hack us to find out where the soft spots are. So we've been getting those briefings. We've been acting on their recommendations in terms of what we need to do to harden our systems. So we're very much uh, paying attention to that, but we feel cautiously optimistic about where we are, not only in Minnesota, but as a country. And then finally, because people will have up to a week after election day uh, for their ballot to be counted, and also because you are strongly encouraging people to take advantage of that absentee ballot, how long will it be before we potentially know some of the outcomes of some of these elections? I'm glad you used the word you just said. You used the word outcomes, and you're one of the first people to do that, and good for you, because um, I want to distinguish between results and outcomes. So. In every state in America this year, election night is gonna look a little different than what we're used to. And I just wanna make sure everyone understands that going in. So when you see, not if, when you see on election night that you don't have 100% of the results, don't blame your county or your city. Don't assume that someone fell asleep at the switch or fell down on the job. No, this is literally by design, by design of the Minnesota legislature this year in giving more time to count ballots and by design of the courts in what is now an agreed to non-appealable um, court order that I mentioned earlier, which is that we now have election day plus seven days to get the ballots in. So that means by definition, we won't know the final results until seven days after the election day, but you use a key word, which is outcomes. I predict for what it's worth that we will know the vast majority of outcomes well before that. us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.